All right, thank you very much. Now in John chapter number 6, we're going to be focusing in on the, um, on the section that starts off in verse number 16, talking about fasting. Now, in, in John 6, you know, we just got done reading the entire chapter. Of course, we, we get to the famous part of, of the, the Lord's Prayer, right? Um, the, the vain repetition that, that the heathen like to repeat over and over again after Jesus said not to make vain repetitions. But um, that's not what the sermon's about. But <clears throat> what we see here is um, he's teaching them how to pray and then right after he teaches them how to pray, he goes into fasting. And look at verse number 16. He says, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Now, it's not a commandment to fast. Um, there's no, no scripture in the Bible that says, you know, you must fast or you must fast this often or anything like that. But it's kind of expected of us. And you could, you could get that from the, from the verbiage here. When you see in verse 17, Jesus is saying, but, but thou, when you fast, he's like explaining, look, when you do this, this is how you should do it. You know, you shouldn't look um, a certain way. You know, you shouldn't look like you're fasting. Now, what, what is fasting? We'll get into that. We'll get into this a little bit more in depth. But um, fasting is basically, I'll just read this from you. In Esther 4, verse 16, the Bible says, Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to law, and if I perish, I perish. All throughout the Bible, you see fasting, it's actually, there's a few different um, aspects of fasting. It always has to do without, like, eating, without eating food. Sometimes it's not eating food and it's not drinking water. Essentially, what you're doing when you're fasting is you're, you're it, well, we're in a, a lot of different things, but um, you're withholding stuff from, your, from yourself. It's, it's a withholding is what a fast is. So whether it be food, whether it be water, whether it be anything else, that's kind of what, it, that's what a fast is. And in the Bible, the, the most common is you're withholding food. And there are a lot of benefits to doing this, and we're going to get into that. And if you've never fasted before, listen to this sermon. Listen to, to all the points we go through, and I think you're going to see that it's something that you should incorporate into your life as a Christian. It's going to help you out spiritually, and it's going to help you to overcome a lot of obstacles in your life. And there's a lot to be said about this, but the first, just the very first one that we saw here in verse 18, um, or verse 17, he says, But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret... Well, look at that last phrase there, shall reward thee openly. So we see right away there's a reward to fasting. So obviously there's a benefit to doing this. It's, now, the most common connection you'll see in the Bible of fasting is prayer. Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting occurs over and over and over again. He just got done teaching them how to pray. And then he says, when you fast, because normally when you're going to do a fast, you're in communication with God. There's a reason for the fast of what you're doing. Um, in the past, people have, have fasted when, um, for example, the children of Israel, when they're losing a battle, when they're in distress, when they're having serious problems, then they'll proclaim a fast to try to get God's attention is basically what it is. You're afflicting yourself. You're, 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 you know, make it, you're making yourself go through some kind of a hardship physically to get to kind of get God's attention. And that's what they do in a fast. In Judges 20, if you remember when that that horrible story of um, of the concubine that got killed by all the sodomites that were that were in um, Benjamin, 
the Benjamites that were, that, that were wicked and they, and they killed her. So then the whole nation of Israel, all the rest of the tribes gathered themselves together as one man and said, we're not going to stand for this. And they went to fight against them. And if you remember, the, the Benjamites actually defeated them the first two times they went out to fight against them. So they went out to fight. You know, hugely outnumbered them, but they were, you know, they were men of war. They were real mighty and strong and, and you know, merciless with um, some of the warriors that were there. Not all of them were Sodomites, but they just, they still like stuck together and just said, no, we're not going to, you know, let you perform justice on these, on these pervert, perverts and Sodomites that did this horrible act. But um, in Judges 20 verse 25, we see after they got after the children of Israel got defeated twice it says and Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel again 18,000 men so that's a pretty serious defeat the second day 18,000 men being killed that's a lot of people all these drew the sword then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So, you know, they're, they're going to God and they're saying, God, you know, like, like we need you with us. And they're weeping. They're upset. They decide to fast and they're offering burnt offerings. All these things are, are you know, they're, they're trying to get God's attention. They need God's power. They need God to help them. So what do they do? They, they afflict themselves. They weep. They're mourning. They're upset, they, they fast, and they, they bring their, their offerings unto God. This is one of the things that you can do to try, again, to try to get God's attention, to get God to do something for you, to get that reward, as he mentioned in Matthew 6, 18, to reward thee, to reward the open. And he's saying, don't do it like the hypocrites do, like the hypocrites that go out and pray, and they make these big orations so that everyone could hear them and be like, oh, wow, that guy is so good at praying and he's so righteous and he's so holy. You know, they make all these statements and they to, just to puff themselves up in the minds of others. He's saying, well, it's the same thing when you fast. He's saying, you don't, don't go going around like, oh, man, I'm so hungry. Like I'm fasting today. I don't know if you know it, but, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not eating today. And man, I'm hungry. Oh, that food smells so good. Oh, this is, you know, don't do that. Don't do that. It's sincere. You know, it's kind of funny, but if you've never fasted before, that is urge. like you really start to get hungry and you'll smell food that nor like when you're not hungry at all, sometimes you don't even notice different scents and stuff. But when you fast and someone's cooking food, I remember one time I was fasting and I, you know, I went to work and that's back when I had my motorcycle and I was driving home and it was like right around dinner time. And there's, you know, people were barbecuing and stuff outside and, you, and you're driving like, oh, and that smells good. Like it's just when you're when you're really hungry, it just smells that much more. It, you, you pick up these senses. You become a lot more aware of your hunger. You become a lot more aware of things. Um, but it's it's really good because what it is is the the that hunger is an appetite of your flesh. Now there's nothing sinful with just eating some food and getting nourishment. Obviously. Um, but it is a desire. It is something your flesh needs to survive. Our body needs food in order, in order to continue going on. So that's a strong desire that your flesh is going to give you to eat food. What fasting, one of the things that fasting does, though, it gives you control over your flesh. So when you have areas of your life that, you wanna, that you're struggling with, a particular sin in your life. Now, I mean, all of our, the reason why we sin is because we're in this flesh. This flesh causes us to sin. The things that, are, that, that we want to do, that we like to do, that feel good. I mean, eating food feels good. It, it tastes good. It's, it, it gives us enjoyment. Typically, when you eat good food, you eat a meal, it satisfies your belly and you feel good. You're, you're, you're satisfying your flesh. When you sin, you're sin you're, you're, you know, whatever sin that may be is driving you to do something because you think it feels good, because it's something you want, you know, you want to do, even though it's against what God tells you to do. Um, but by fasting, what you're doing is saying, I'm in charge. I'm in control over my body. If my body's going to be telling me, no, man, you really got to eat. You got to do it. I'm going to say no. No, you're not going to dictate what I'm going to do. I'm the one in control of my body. I'm going to keep my body in subjection. And when you fast, it will, it will literally help you to do that. Because this is an area 
that you can very strictly control and when you're able to learn that control over your body you can start applying that to different areas and you can remember well I was able to withhold food from myself so whatever sin it is that you're having you're struggling with you're having a hard time with I mean it doesn't matter what it is you can remember it's like I was able to withhold food there's no reason why I can't withhold alcohol or you know bad movies or bad music or what, whatever whatever it is that you're struggling with in your life I don't know whatever the sin may be if you if you could look back and look at your experience and say look I was able I had these strong desires and my flesh is telling me to do this but I was able to say no and I was able to get through it and and yeah it was a little bit painful yeah I, you know I, I suffered a little bit but I was able to make it through that point and you can you could use that to apply it to other sins in your life now um, I'm getting way ahead of myself I'm gonna be jumping all over my notes today because this is not coming out the way that it was planned but um, but that's fine Jesus said um, another another just one more point on it kind of being expected of us we saw in Matthew 6 that that he said when you fast just kind of saying that okay when you do this this is how you're gonna do it in Matthew 9 it says in verse 14, Then came to him his dis the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride, bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. And he's talking about himself. When, when Jesus is gone, he's saying, Then they're going to fast. His disciple, his his literal disciples that were with him didn't fast, and that's what they were asking. They're saying, "Look, the 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 disciples of John fasted, the disciples even of the Pharisees fasted, but they're saying well, your disciples don't fast. How come?" And he's saying, "Well, that's because I'm here with them." And notice he he also associates in their mourning. He says, "Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them?" Um, you know, I mentioned the, the benefits that you can get about fasting with, with helping you take control of your body, but oftentimes fasting is used in extreme situations. And when you're going through serious mourning, serious trials, things happen as we saw already with the, with the um, children of Israel and their battles. They're losing a battle, they're losing a bunch of men. God, we need you to hear us. You know, we, we normally, you should be praying every day. You should be praying to God, bringing your troubles to Him, asking Him to help you out with stuff. But sometimes you have some real serious problems in your life. That is a good time to fast. That is a good time to say, like, God, like, like I'm really serious about this, God. I need your help. And fasting is one of the ways that you can do that. Now, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, fasting is normally withholding food or withholding water or both, you know, from yourself for a period of time. But in 1 Corinthians 7, it's not necessarily just food and water. And, and typically when you fast, you ought to try to fast from anything gratifying to the flesh, not just the food and water. Um, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 4 tells us, The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Talking about a relationship between a husband and wife and, and saying that, you know, to, to have a healthy relationship and that and, and it says in verse 5, defraud ye not one the other. So he's saying don't withhold that from your spouse that, that this is something that's normal you should be doing. But here's the one exception. He says, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So he's saying this is this is the one exception is when you're doing a fast, you're doing fasting and prayer, okay, you consent to it and say, yeah, we're, I'm going to fast, we all, we're, not, we're going to withhold this aspect of our relationship, and it's, it's for a short period of time. I mean, typically when you're fasting, you know, I know Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, but that's not very common. Okay, and that's, that's not a, what people would normally do as far as the most common fast. A fast normally lasts one day or three days. You find all throughout the Bible, I mean, it's depending on the situation. We saw in Esther, it was a, a three-day fast. 
Okay, so this is what it's talking about. And this is what they're saying. It's a set time, you know in advance, okay, I'm gonna be fasting for a day, or I'm gonna set and you gotta set your you gotta set your fast in advance. Okay, you know this is not something you wanna go into and be like, well, I'm gonna fast and see how long I could go. No. <laughs> You'll fail. Because as soon as you start, you're like, oh, well, at least I fasted for six hours. Okay, I'm done. You know, like I'm going to deceive. You have to have that set in your mind in advance. Just be like, okay, from, nor normally when I do a fast, I'll start like after dinner and a certain night. Okay, that's, that's kind of when it starts. But I usually just say from morning until morning. So when I wake up the next day, I'm just not going to eat. And then I'm just not going to eat for the entire day. And then the next day I'll start eating. That's that's normally what I do. I mean, do what you want. It's not that there's no like rules about fasting in the Bible, but um, I usually just make sure I make it through. I mean, some people I think go maybe sun up to sundown as a fast. So you know, you can go multiple days. You go a few days of not eating and drinking. But basic the point I was getting at here though is is, is even the relationship with your wife. You know, you're kind of withholding all, all the physical aspects of your life, all the physical gratification that you get, the fast is, is kind of, you're, you're, you're putting all of that aside and dedicating all of your focus and attention to God. And saying, God, I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to do any of these things, I'm just going to, I'm just going to pray to you. And um, if you've never fasted before, start a little bit easier. You know, I wouldn't do a, I wouldn't do a no food and water. I would just start with a no food. It's a lot easier to do no food than it is to do food and water. Because at least with water, I mean, you could, you could keep chugging some water and, and still kind of feel a little bit satisfied. You're still going to be hungry, don't get me wrong. Okay, you will, you will be hungry and you'll experience that hunger if you don't eat. Even just drinking water. But it's a little bit easier. I mean, when you get thirsty, you could take a drink. But um, start with that. And um, you know, we see even Jesus fasted in, in Matthew 4, verse 1. The Bible says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and night, 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And we could get from, gather from that statement that he wasn't fasting by withholding water from himself. Because if you fast for 40 days and 40 nights, the first thing you're going to be is thirsty if you're withholding water. Because your body needs water way more than it needs food. You can't go as long without water as you can without food. You go a lot, your body go a lot. I mean, there are people today that fast, can fast for 40 days. It's, it doesn't have to be a miraculous event. Your body, you can, you can fast for 40 days and, and survive it. It's not necessarily recommended for the, you know, for health reasons. That's a long time to go without food. But, I mean, your, your body can handle it. But there's no way you can go 40 days without drinking water, short of a miracle. Moses was able to do that, and that was a miraculous event. When Moses went 40 days and 40 nights in the mount, in the presence of God, without food and water. But I think that's why he was able to do it, because he was like literally in the presence of God at the mountain, and God sustained him. And God miraculously sustained his body. But that is not something, I mean, I don't know what the, I don't know what the science is, three days or five days or something like that. Somewhere, somewhere three to five days, I think, is where you're just going to die from, from dehydration, from a lack of water. Um, so, um, start off with, with, a, with a, you know, just a food, withholding food from yourself and, and, and as, you know, other, other physical aspects of your life. And um, it, it will help you. But let's see some other reasons why people fast. Um, we mentioned, we saw earlier that, that mourning is associated with that. There's lots of reasons people mourn. Um, there was mourning when the... King Saul and his sons died. And turn, if you would, to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 1. We'll see this here because we're going to go in another chapter in 2 Samuel anyways. Turn to 2 Samuel. All these reasons for fasting are all really similar and associated with each other, but the, the cause that, that gets you to start a fast might be a little bit different. But, but all the elements are basically the same. So we'll see like mourning. Here it was, you know, the, the children of Israel were losing a battle. So they were mourning and praying and fasting. In 2 Samuel 1 verse 12, it says, And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son, 
and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. So here they were just grieving. They were grieving over the loss of, of Saul and, and his sons and, you know, and all these people. That was just a reason why they fasted. Flip over to 2 Samuel chapter 12, just um, a few pages over, chapter 12. We're going to see here the story of, of David when he loses his, his infant child. Because he also fasted. Let's, we're going to start reading in verse number 16 of 2 Samuel 12. The Bible reads, David therefore besought God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth. But he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And this is, um, you know, we saw that people did do a fast because King Saul and his, and his sons were dead and they were weeping and they were mourning. But really, David had, had, had it right here because he's saying, you know, and, and that was more, I think common for people when they're grieving, when they're mourning, to just to not want to eat and to, and to fast. And you see that today. I mean, people aren't necessarily even intentionally like withholding food from themselves. But when you get so upset, I mean, I've seen people lose, like especially in really tragic deaths, you know, a mother loses their child and they just don't want to eat because they don't feel like eating because they are so upset and they're so grieving that like people say like, look, come on, you got to eat. Like, no, like I don't want anything because their stomach is upset, because they're just really emotionally drained and they don't feel like even putting any type of food into their mouth. That's kind of just a normal, natural reaction in, in, in a serious time of grief. But what David was using the fasting for here was to, to get in prayer with God and to get God to help him out and to seek God's power and his, and, and, and his help in this situation. Now, David was being judged. But even though David was being judged for his sin with Bathsheba, with, with losing his child, you know, the, the people didn't understand what he's doing. They're like, they thought he was going to lose it. They're like, man, he's, he's weeping and he's fasting. He's doing all this stuff. When he finds out the child's dead, he's just going to, he's going to lose it. But that's not what happened at all. The reason why he was doing all that stuff is because he was entreating for God. And he was, he was withholding this stuff. And he, that's why he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? He's like, well, there's no reason to fast anymore. The whole point of the fast was so that he can just pray to God and devote himself to just, just completely trying to get God's help and get God's attention. And that's one of the reasons why we fast is, is for those very reasons. Anytime I set out to do a fast, I've always decided in advance, what am I praying for? I'm going to pray some very, very specific prayers, some very important needs in my life and and. You know, you gain a lot from the fasting, as I mentioned, with you know gaining power over your own body and stuff. But but there's still a, a focus. There's still a goal of saying I am going to fast because I really want God's help in this particular area of my life, whatever it may be. I mean, there's uh, um, I fasted and prayed for the like the soul winning marathon. To me, that's a really big event. I want I want as much of God's power on us as possible. I fasted and prayed for other personal issues that I've had in my life. Or for even for other people, and just and just really get serious about it, and um, and God will hear that, and that's what he, and, and he even said that in Matthew six where we started off that God will reward thee openly, 
That he's not saying it's a foolish thing to fast. He's not, you know, there's obviously power in it. And um, we see that power. I was going to get to it later, but we'll just look at it um, right now. You know the story of the, of the disciples when they weren't able to cast out the devil from the, um, in Matthew 17, they were trying to, to cast out the devil from the, um, from the child. And, was, you know, the guy's like, hey, I've, you know, I, I've, your disciples weren't able to cast out this devil. So Jesus did it, and he tells them, he says, This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So you see there, there was something that the disciples weren't able to do. There was a level of, of, of God's power upon them that they weren't able to have without doing prayer and fasting. Like, that was, that was part of it. They're saying this was a very difficult situation. This was, this was a really hard case. This was a time when you needed prayer and fasting in order, in order to have God's power upon you, in order to be able to cast that devil out. That's what, that's what Jesus Christ said. Now, Jesus was able to do it. To me, that tells me I mean, Jesus, I think, fasted a lot. We know he prayed a lot. There's not much mention of him fasting other than when, the, when Satan tempted him in the wilderness. But you imagine they're, you know, they're walking around and, and they're, they're you know, preaching the gospel and doing all these things. We know Jesus ate, but, but I, th I have a feeling he, he fasted quite a bit. You meant when they were going through the, the corn fields and, and the, um, the Pharisees were complaining about, about his disciples eating with unwashed hands and all this other stuff and, and picking corn on the Sabbath day and eating it. Um, it, does, it says that his disciples were eating. It didn't say Jesus was. So like Jesus wasn't getting rebuked for eating. I think Jesus was fasting during that time while, while his disciples were eating. He was fasting, but, um, and he was able to do all these great miracles and stuff. Anyways, now I know he was the son of God, he was God in the flesh, and he had this power, but I still believe that if Jesus would be an example for us, I believe Jesus was fasting as well. It doesn't tell us how often he did it, though, and that's also important to note. Now, um, <clears throat> every individual has to take this. It's not a commandment, like I said, and, and you have to, to understand your own body and what you're going through. So like if you have a woman that's, you know, nursing and, and feeding her child, it probably isn't going to be that healthy to do a fast while you're caring for your infant child that's still nursing on you. Your body has to be able to produce that stuff. So I wouldn't recommend it for someone in that situation. Elderly people, I mean, like if you're in poor health, it's not wise to do a fast at that time. Everyone needs to look at themselves and look at your own health and look at your situation and be like, okay, and maybe you can shorten up the fast and just be like, okay, well, I, you know, my body can't handle this. Like, it just, it literally, I can't do this. And it's not just because, oh, I feel so hungry, but because, like, you might die or something because you don't have any food. Then you can do a fast, but just make it a little bit shorter and just be like, okay, this is what I'm going to do for God. So you, you can all, everyone can, can kind of come up with your own fast. But I would, I mean, if you're healthy, if you're, if there's nothing, like, wrong with you, Try to, try to do an extended fast. It's, it's, it'll, it'll be good for you. Um, we see prayer and fasting going hand in hand. Turn, if you would, to Acts, Acts chapter 10. We see a lot, um, quite a few times in the book of Acts, references to people fasting. And again, it's always linked with prayer. Well, mostly linked with prayer. I want to say always. But um, Acts chapter 10, verse number 30. We see here Cornelius, and Cornelius wasn't even saved, but he was praying. It says in, in verse 30, and Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. So here we see Cornelius was praying, and that's when he sends Peter to him to preach him the gospel and everyone in his house, and, um, but that his prayer was answered through fasting and prayer. Look at chapter 13 in, in Acts. Acts 13, verse 1. Acts 13, 1 says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. 
So here again, we see the fasting and the prayer. And this was an important work that needed to be done. The Holy Ghost answered. It says that they, they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Through their fasting and ministering to the Lord, the Holy Ghost answers them and says, okay, this is what I want you to do. Separate Barnabas and Saul. He's like, I've got a work for them to do. This is a big work. This is a calling from God. So what did they do? They fasted and prayed again before laying their hands on him and sending him out. They're trying to get as much power from God as possible and saying, you know what, God, this is serious. We're treating this very serious. We're going to fast. We're going to pray. You know, bless these men as they go out and preach your word. Keep them safe. Do, you know, give them all the blessings. And, and they laid their hands on them and they sent them out to do God's work. And, and they had used fasting and prayer when they did that. Flip over to chapter 14, just the next chapter over. Acts 14, verse 23. It says, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Again, prayer and fasting involved with setting up pastors in the church, mm -hmm. with, with sending the people out, with or ordination of, of men of God that are going to embark on a very great work for God and going to do a, a very important job. They, they thought that was important enough for them to pray and for fast. Now think about other things in your life. You have important things that are going on. Think about fasting. A lot of us these days, I don't know, it doesn't seem to be very common anymore in Christian culture to, to do a fast. I think people just kind of forget about it. They don't even think about it. But when we look at all these sections so far we read in the Bible about people fasting, it happens quite a bit in the Bible. I am not turning to every reference of fasting in the Bible. There are a lot more than what we are looking at today. And you will find what I'm saying is true in all these instances. I mean, people are looking to God and seeking God and wanting God's help. They're doing a fast. And, and if you want God's help in your life with things, especially, I mean, <coughs> the Bible tells us, and this is a separate sermon on prayer more, but you're obeying God's commandments, He's going to hear you. He's going to be a lot more likely to listen to what you have to say when you're doing what's right first, when you're listening to Him. If you're listening to what He said in His commandments, then He sees that you'll listen to Him. So like when you pray to God, you ask him for something, how is he going to know that you're going to listen to his answer? Right? If you're not listening to everything else he says. If he's like, look, I already told you to do this, 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 and this, and now you're praying to me and expecting an answer? You didn't listen to, to, to anything that I have written here. So why, why are you going to listen to me now? And um, so obviously we need, to, we need to be listening, first of all, just first and foremost, just through the Bible specifically to what's here and um, specifically the words in the Bible but then when you pray to God if you're doing those things that's when you'll be able to expect him to answer your prayer but um, add fasting to that that it's a, it's a good way to, to to get right with to get God's attention now another reason that people will fast is with getting right with God turn if you would to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. We see examples of people trying to get right with God when they recognize that they've sinned and, and they want to, to just entreat with God and, and um, ask for forgiveness and, and try to get right with Him. They'll... they'll They'll fast. And, and, often, and you'll see again, there's going to be mourning. There's going to be people who are upset. And it's associated with the fasting, and they're going to be praying unto God. Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah 9 and verse 1, the Bible reads, Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. So this is serious trying to get right with God here. They're, they were fasting. Now, the, when... With grieving and mourning and being sad, that often that goes hand in hand with people dressing in sackcloth and ashes, and that's it's a it's a humbling of yourself, it's a humility. So instead of wearing your nice fancy clothes, they would put on just just like a sack or something, just like covering themselves, 
but really humble, really, you know, like meager way to, to, to clothe yourself. And it was obvious that, that you're mourning, that you're upset. And um, they would also, they fasted with this. And it says they separated themselves from all strangers. So when they're getting right with God, they were separating themselves from the world. Right? They're separating themselves and getting right and saying, okay, we're not going to do this. And they stood and they confessed their sins to God. If you've got some major sin in your life, again, you should grieve. You should be sad about it. You should be sorry about the sins that you commit when, when after you're saved and you commit some, some sin against God. That should, that should grieve your heart. You should be upset about that. You should be sad about that. And you should mourn about that and treat it seriously and don't just blow it off and be like, oh, well, God's just forgiving anyways. You ought not to have that attitude. You sin against God, you ought to treat it as a, as a serious deal and say, look, God treats these sins serious. He, he treats sin so serious, he sends people to hell over it. Yeah. Okay? That's how God views it. So don't be flippant with your sins. And when you want to get right with God, when you recognize, hey, man, I've, I've done wrong, you should, be, you should be sorry for that. That's just one more sin that Jesus had on his shoulders when he died for your sins on the cross. That's one more. But we need, you know, we ought to treat it seriously. You ought to fast and entreat God and, and, and separate yourself from the world. And get right with them. Confess your sins to them. And then look what it is. As they read in the book of the law of their God for one-fourth part of the day. That's six hours. I mean, you, thought, you thought church was long last week when I preached for an hour and 20 minutes? <laughs> they were reading the law over six hours. That's a long time. But this is, this is how serious they were. I mean, they really wanted to get right with God. They, you know, we're confessing our sins. We're fasting. You know, we're mourning. And we're just going gonna to read God's law. And then another fourth part, so six more hours, they confessed and worshiped. That was just the preaching and the reading for, the six part, for this, those six hours for the fourth part of the day. That wasn't the, the worshiping and, and singing and praising God. That was, that was another six hours. So that's a long, that's a, the 12 hour church service, that's a long time. But again, that, that, I mean, they were, they were serious. They were dedicated. I mean, they, that was coming from their hearts. They weren't doing it for a show. They wanted to get right with God, and that's what they did. Um, turn over to Joel chapter 2. Now, Joel chapter 2, the first part of this chapter is really heavily focused on the day of the Lord. And all the Old Testament scriptures, you'll find like. Um, Oftentimes, there's a, there's a dual prophecy because they're preaching about things that are going to happen in the short term, and then they're also preaching about things that are going to happen at like end times prophecies as well. And you know, you always should be kind of careful and, and understand the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament. So, God's given us the book of Revelation to reveal what's going to happen in the end times. So that needs to line up with what we're seeing in the Old Testament because the Old Testament sometimes you have prophecies of things that already happened. And even in Joel 2, it talks about, um, uh, about the, the prophecy that was already fulfilled when Jesus came back, when it says your, your old men's visions and your, and your, and your um, young men will dream dreams. And um, you know, he poured out his spirit upon them and they were preaching. And that was at the day of Pentecost was, the, um, was, was one of the fulfillments of that. So it may seem like it's talking about the, the end times, but it's not necessarily always every single verse talking about what's going to happen in the end times. There's duality there with prophecy. But um, anyways, if you're in Joel 2, look at verse number 12. Because in the first 11 verses, he's talking about that dreadful day of the Lord. And he's going through like all these, you know, some of these horrible things are going to happen on the day of the Lord and how bad of a day that's going to be basically for, for the world, for the unsaved world when God's going to come back and judge the earth. But he says in verse 12 here, he says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even turn to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. This is what God's asking them to do. Like he's saying, okay, you've been in a lot of sin. You're being judged because you, you've done all this wickedness. And this is what we're going to apply to ourselves. Turn ye even to me with all of your heart. Turn back to, you know, turn to God with all of your heart. You're in a lot of sins. You're in, you have a lot of problems. He says, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. You should be sad about it. Fast, weep. He says, and rend your heart and not your garment. See, in the Bible, we, we, we read about people when they get upset, they'd rend their clothing. They'd rend their garments. They'd, they'd tear their, their clothing as a sign of, of them just being so upset. They'd, just, they'd, they'd tear their clothing. 
And that was kind of a big deal because clothing in the Bible was very, it was a lot more precious. You know, here, you could go down any store and you've got racks and racks full of all these clothes made in China and all this stuff. Just factories just, just, just pump this stuff out. Clothing, when you had to like literally like sew it, you don't have a sewing machine, you don't have all this extra tools and, and, and the appliances and, the, and manufacturing that we have today, it was a lot harder to come by clothing. Clothing was a lot more valuable, it was a lot more precious. So when they would rip their clothing, it was, it was a sign, I mean, they're really upset because they're, they're tearing something that, that had some good value to them. But God's telling them here, he says, rend your heart, not your garments. He doesn't care about your clothing getting ripped and that outward showing of it. He wants the inside. You, you need to, to you know, rip your heart open to God, so to speak, and, and, and be sorry for your sins. Be sad about it. Mourn for it and fast over it. He says, And not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. So he's explaining, look, even when you've done all kinds of horrible sins, turn back to God because God is gracious. He is merciful. He is slow to anger and he is of great kindness. Even when you've got, if you, if you end up backsliding and you get really far away from God, don't think to yourself, don't let your mind deceive you and say, well, God will never be, I'll never be acceptable in God's sight again. I could just never get right with God now because I've just gone, I've, I'm just, I'm just a sinner now and, and just forget it. I'm, uh, it's, it's too much. Don't have that attitude. He says, you need to be sorry about it. You know, rip open your heart, and, but just turn back to God because you don't know. You don't know how gracious and how merciful and, 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 and what God will do for you. David didn't know. David committed a grievous sin. He committed adultery and murder. Things that probably nobody in this room has ever done before. Adultery and murder. But David poured out his heart. He ripped his heart open to God. We can see that in the Psalms. He was sorry for his sin. He, it, didn't, it wasn't something that he dealt with lightly. It was a big deal to him. And he entreated God and he mourned and he fasted and he wept before God because he said, you know what, I, maybe, maybe God will spare the life of this child. But he truly was sorry for it. And we ought to be too. That's the attitude that we ought to have as Christians is just is being able to go back to God. And we don't know. I mean, maybe he will be, maybe he will be merciful to us. Verse 14 says, Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Turn, if you would, to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah 3, we see another situation here with Jonah. Of course, Jonah is most, most famous for the, the whale swallowing him up. But what was Jonah being told to do? He was being told to go and preach to the city of Nineveh. See, the, the, the people of Nineveh were, were, were sinning against God, and God was real angry about it, whatever they were doing. They were, you know, God, God was going to destroy their city. He was going to overthrow the city, and he was going to destroy them. But he wanted Jonah to preach and tell him about it first. He wanted them to know and to have an opportunity to hear that what they were doing was wrong and that they needed to change. So he sends Jonah to do this. And that's what the first couple of chapters are Jonah disobeying God and then reaping the consequences for it and all kinds of other stuff going on there. But in chapter 3, verse number 4, we see it says right here in the Bible, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and satin ashes and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, Let neither man nor beast Herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. These are getting real serious. And look, I don't care if it's a man or an animal. Like, I don't want anybody eating or drinking. They, they received this message from God. They received it perfectly. I mean, it, they heard and believed. And that's the most important thing. They, you know, Jonah came into town and he's preaching against it, saying, you know, God's going to overthrow, yet 40 days and God shall overthrow the city. And they said, wow. 
And they believe that. They believe the word of God. So we need, we need to, you know, really get right with God here. We need to entreat the Lord. So he said, I don't want animals, herds, flocks, men, women. No, I don't want anybody eating. He said, I don't, I don't want, this is not going to be done. He said, let them not taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast, verse 8, be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. This is after they believed, right? Well, what do we need to do to be saved? We need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed. They believed right at the preaching early on. After you believe, now it's time for some repenting. Now it's time for you to be getting right with God. And that's what we see here. He's saying, look, we're going we're gonna to sit in sackcloth and ashes. We're going to fast and Everyone needs to turn from their evil way. We need to, to get this sin out of our life. We need to get this stuff out of here. And from the violence that is in their hands. Verse 9, Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? So again, they're saying, look, we need to do all of this stuff because maybe, just maybe, God will be gracious unto us. He's already decreed that we're, he's going to destroy this city. But you know what? We still got some time. And if you're alive today, you still got some time. Entreat God for your sins. Get, get rid of the sins. Be sorry about your sins. It should grieve you in your heart that you're doing wrong. But turn back to God. Turn and see God. And, and you know what? Those are good works. It says in verse 10. It says, And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So here we see a great example of people mourning and fasting and weeping and turning from their sin and getting the sin out of their life, and God saying, okay, you know what? I will not pass judgment on you. God answered the prayer. God saw their works. God saw that they had a change of heart. God saw that they had a change of action. God saw that they were changing their life and said, okay, because of that, because you humbled yourself, because you've done that, which is right, I will not destroy your city. Um, all these instances we've seen so far, you know, fasting in and of itself, especially when it's involved with mourning and weeping, it's a humbling of yourself. You're humbling your soul. And I'll just read this for you in the book of Psalms. Turn if you would. Uh, we're almost done here. We're wrapping it up. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 69. I'm going to read from you from Psalm 35, 13. Psalm 69 is where you're going. Psalm 35, 13 reads, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. He's talking about people here in Psalm 35 that were, you know, um, treating him poorly. They were being his enemy. They were doing bad things unto David, but he says, look, you know, God, and he was, he was going to God for vengeance. He was going to God to make things right. He wasn't taking matters in his own hand. But he said, look, they're treating my good for, they're, they're treating me evil for my good. He said, when they were sick, when they, you know, he says, well, I, um, when they were sick, my clothing was sackled. I, I mourned for them. I fasted for them. I prayed for them when they were going through hard times, but now they're just coming and attacking me. And he's saying, to God, look what I've done for them, God. You know, you know my heart. I was looking out for them. I was praying for them. I wanted good upon them, but now they're, they're coming back at me. Um, but he says here, he humbled his soul with fasting. It's a humbling of yourself. It's a humbling of your soul. When you fast, you're withholding that food for yourself. It's a it's humbling experience. You're in Psalm 69, verse 10. It says, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. So we see here a chastening of your soul. It's a, you're humbling your soul and you're chastening your soul. You're, you're disciplining it. You're, you're keeping your soul in check. You're, you're, you're keeping yourself in charge of your body and of things that are going on. When you fast, you're, you're, it's a chastening of yourself, of your soul. Ezra 8 verse 21 says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us. So he's saying the reason why we're afflicting ourselves, we're fasting, which is an affliction, to seek the right way from God and for our little ones and for all of our substance. And um, 
all these various reasons, you know, it could be you're grieving, but ultimately the reason why you fast, the most important reason to fast is to get right with God, to ask things of God, to, to ask for His mercy, to ask for, you know, what, when He was sending men of God out to do a great work, to pray for other people, and um, for yourself to get control of yourself, to, get, to help you get rid of the sin in your life by learning how to do without the things that your flesh desires. To just train yourself and to train your body. And that's the last part we're going to focus on tonight. And we, we covered this last week, in, or last Wednesday actually, in John 16. John 16, 1, I touch on this briefly. John 16, 1 says, These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. Jesus is often telling his disciples things in advance. Like in that case, it was about him being crucified. He's like, I'm going to be gone from you. Uh, but, but I don't want you to be offended by this. I don't want this to shake you up. I don't want this to move you because it has to happen. So when Jesus would tell people in advance, hey, this is going to happen, it's so that you can be prepared for that event. Whatever is going to happen, you need to know, hey, this is going to happen. I don't want you to be shaken up by this. I'm going to be put to death. But don't think that, that Satan has had the victory because he hasn't. You know, don't think that Maybe, he, you know, maybe Jesus wasn't the Messiah. Don't, don't start to doubt or question. I'm telling you right now that these things are going to happen so that when they do happen, you can be like, oh yeah, he told us about this. And you could remember that. And Jesus did that uh, quite a few times in the Bible. And that's why he tells us about the end times events as well. Matthew 24, Mark 3, and other places in the Bible. He's giving us a heads up. He's giving us a warning. He's telling you, hey, these events are going to happen. You need to be prepared for this. You need to be prepared in your mind. You need to just be prepared in general. Just, just say, okay, well, I know this is going to happen, so I won't be taken off guard. This isn't going to surprise me. This isn't going to shock me when it comes to pass. And what the way that applies with fasting is that we don't know. I mean, if we're getting close to the end times... The Bible says there's going to be famines and pestilences. You know, there's going to be wars. All these things are be going on. We don't know what our financial situation is going to be like. We don't know, you know, even if, even if it's not the end times, you know, this country is behaving so wickedly and, and the morals have just gone out the window and with children being put to death, with sodomy rampant, with all these, the embracing of sin that this country is doing, God's going to judge our country. It's going to happen, whether it be at the judgment when Jesus Christ comes back because we're so close to that time or not, whether it just be a judgment that God sends. Okay, we are going to be in the midst of this country. Now, God's able to save us out of any of those tribulations. Yeah. You know, God is able to remove, as he removed Lot out of Sodom, as he, you know, he, he, he helped Noah through the flood. These things can happen. So, you know, you just need to live righteously. But... It doesn't mean that you won't experience any of it. Think of Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah was thrown into prison, and this was during the time when, when the children of Israel were, were still under attack of, by Babylon, before they were, like, during and after. As the book of Jeremiah kind of takes place over a lot of period of time. But Jeremiah was in Jerusalem. He was, you know, he was in the land when, um, when they were being besieged. You know, when they're being besieged and there's a famine and, and Jeremiah was part of this. He was a great Christian. He's a great man of God. He experienced all kinds of horrible. He, he went through hunger. He was thrown into that dungeon and they were like feeding him like the bread of affliction, bread and water of affliction. Like, I don't think he was getting very much food. What I'm saying is that we don't know what the future holds for us. It's very likely that we will end up, I mean, there could be a famine in our land. God can cause it not to rain very easily and crops not to grow and, and, and he can, I mean, all, all kinds of things. Just think about like the power grid going down or whatever, anything. And a grocery store is just the shelves going bare. What are you going to do? You ought to be prepared for that, but also be prepared to just be hungry. To be hungry. Right now, everyone I know is living like, even if you don't have very much money at all, I understand that, but in this country, even our poor are, are living pretty well. That don't go that hungry. I mean, we're you, you, you see poor people with cell phones, okay? And that's what that's considered poor in this country. I mean, you're poor, but you've got a cell phone like that. And we've just got this weird mindset that like somehow that's poor, or like it's not at all. Like that's not real, really being poor. 
I mean, that, that's, that's, I know, you know, there's a lot of that going on, but it's just poor, it's like you have, you have almost nothing. But we can be in that situation very quickly and very easily. When you fast, you prepare yourself. So when you do, if you do have to go through something like that, you can be like, well, I know what this is like. I know how the hunger pains are going to come. I know it's going to come on harder at first, and then as you go, it's going to ease, and it's going to get a little bit better. I know that the relief is coming a little bit later, so I'm going to make it through this. And that's what the Bible says in Romans 5.3. It says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So when you go through those hard times, what this verse is saying, when you go through tribulation, when you go through those hard times of people persecuting you, hey, you know what you get out of that? You learn patience. You learn how to deal with that. You know that you can make it through this. The more tough times you go through and you make it out of, you say like, well, I made it through that. I made it through that. Hey, this isn't even as hard as that other time. It gives you the patience to make it through and patience gives you experience and experience gives you hope. The more times things happen, the more experience you gain, the more hope and the more confident you're going to be. I made it through this. So when you fasted, you fast, you know, I say, oh, I fasted for one day, I fasted for one day, I fasted for one day, just over a course of however long, a year, two years, whatever. Now I'm going to fast for three days. I've, you know, I've, done, I've done these other fasts. I'm going I'm to up a little bit. I'm going to try doing a little bit more. Okay, I've done that. I mean, it's, it's like working out and other things. You know, you get through that pain. You, you're, someone working out for the very first time, you know, it's easy to just to quit. You start lifting weights or whatever. Like, oh man, my arms are starting to hurt. Well, without that experience of knowing, no, you could push through that. Or you're running. You could get a, you know, the second wind. You push yourself and keep going. You get over that hurdle. You could keep on going a lot longer. And you, you learn these things through the experience, through doing it. Um, first, you just go through the tribulation. But, uh, you know, like I was saying here, the, this tribulation, you go through those problems. And that's going to work patience to be able to say, well, I could do this again. And I could do this again. So with fasting, you know, that, that preparation you can have for hard times. It, it, there's, there's so many benefits to fasting. Your first goal and first motivation for doing it is to, to get God's attention to pray to God. That should, be, that should kind of be the, the number one. But you gain so much more by doing this. Like I said, being able to control your flesh, control your appetites, apply that to other sins in your life, be, know what it's like to experience these, these desires of your flesh and be able to overcome that and give you the confidence to overcome any sin in your life, overcome any fleshly desire in your life. So I encourage everyone, if you've never done it before, I encourage you to do it. If you have done it before, Keep doing it. Keep it up. I mean, decide for yourself. Look, you, you'll know how often you should be doing or whatever, but it should be a part of a Christian's life. I believe that. Um, it, it's talked about plenty of times in the Bible. And as we saw in, in Mark 16, it says, Thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. You pray and fast to God, God will reward you for that. Let's bow our heads and a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. For your words, dear God, I pray that you would please help us to just have more of an understanding of fasting, dear Lord, and why it's so important in our lives. God, I pray that you would please help us to be able to overcome the sins in our life, dear Lord. Help us to be able to deny our flesh and, um, and grow closer to you. God, we pray that your ears would always be open unto our prayers, dear Lord. And that um, especially when we, when we fast, that, that you would really hearken unto us and be merciful and kind. Lord, help us to, to repent of our sins, be sorry for them, dear God, and to get them out of our life that, um, that we can just grow closer to you and be used by you to do mighty, wonderful things in the name of Jesus Christ, whose name we pray. Amen.